Brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ, in the sixth year after migration, he makes the intention to do what? Go into the offense. Fight again? No. No fighting. But he wants to go and do Umrah. Perform a pilgrimage, a Umrah, where they circulate around the house of Allah as an act of worship. And they do Sa'i, that act of walking and at point, point jogging from one mountain to another mountain, imitating a wonderful lady. Her name was Hajar. What she did was remarkable and it became an act of worship for the men and women to imitate Hajar salam. So the Prophet wants to do this act of worship which is Umrah. And you have to feel them, not the Prophet, because there's also 1400 companions joining the Prophet ﷺ, going to Umrah, going back to Mecca. Mecca was a city the Prophet ﷺ was born in. Mecca was the city the Prophet lived 53 years in after six years from leaving it, running away for his life and to preach and to talk to people about Islam. Now, can you imagine the emotions? of coming back to Mecca and the companions who had to run away as well. And now they all want to go to Mecca. Brothers and sisters, they have no intention for war, no intention to fight whatsoever. It is not there. That is proven by some companions going with no weapons whatsoever. Some had little bit of weapons, some had some armor, but to the most part, nothing to go actually have a battle with. So now they head towards performing their Umrah. On their way, they come to a point where they wear the clothing to perform the pilgrimage. Specific clothing Allah demands of us to wear. Specifically for the brothers. Two sheets to the top and the bottom. The other thing they did was marked the sacrificial animals. So there's some animals they had the marking on it that this is to be sacrificed for Allah. They will feed the people, so all the good that will come out of it, fantastic, showing clearly we're not coming to fight. And the Prophet ﷺ being the proactive, intelligent man, he doesn't just go and let's see what happens in that way, no. He takes the means. So while him and 1400 companions are going to Umrah, he sends a scout, someone to go get the reaction of Quraysh. What is Quraysh thinking about the coming of the Prophet and the companions وسلم, and radiallahu anhum? What's the reaction? So the Prophet وسلم, continued to go, continued to go. Events on the way to Mecca. All of a sudden, as the Prophet was heading to Mecca, who does he meet? The scout he sent. You guys got that? The scout he sent. So the scout, you can also think about it physically or physics wise, he goes faster than the army. So he can go by one, as a one individual to Mecca and come back before the army as a whole or the group arrive. So the Prophet ﷺ hears from him, what's the update? Look what he tells him. The scout returns and tells him, Quraysh wants to fight. Quraysh heard about your coming and they want to fight you all. What do you think the Prophet ﷺ will do? Let me test you. Halas, we had several sessions. What do you guys think the Prophet ﷺ will do? Take a shot, that is. Just take a think, I guess. Huh? I'm taking my time, you know why? Because you remember this pause. He got advice. What should we do? So if the Prophet ﷺ, the one who receives revelation, took the time every now and then, you, see, you notice that? Here, in that event, what should we do? What should we do? What do you guys think? Give me your thoughts. Ashiru That's how his attitude. An authentic narration. Ready for this sentence? I did not learn it till I was preparing for this. May Allah grant you all Jannah because every one of you was means for me to learn more. May Allah also make you all means for me to apply what I'm learning. Say Ameen. And may the angel will say, and you too. So it goes both ways, inshallah. The companion said, Wallahi, ma ra'ayna. We have never seen anyone seeks counsel, seeks advice more than the Prophet. No one did it more than him. So this is something you and I should adopt. I don't care what my parents think. I don't care what my friends think. I don't care what the world, I'll do whatever is in my mind. That's not a, what a Muslim behaves like. Counsel, what do you think? You ask, remember, one with experience, khabir, and the one that you trust. Because someone may know, but they don't trust you. 
or you don't trust him. Fair enough. So you want someone trustworthy and someone knowledgeable. And the Prophet is asking the companions. Then the Prophet ﷺ gives his opinion. Ready to hear the Prophet's opinion? His opinion, he says, what do you guys think? If we go, so there's a group of Quraysh coming. So he says, what if we go right now to their direction, we go towards them and we fight them? What do you guys think? And when, if we defeat them, that weakens Quraysh. That makes Quraysh weaker. Abu Bakr Siddiq spoke. He said, Ya Rasulullah, look, he, he, he opened the floor. So Abu Bakr Siddiq said, Ya Rasulullah, we left for what intention? What to do? Say it. Umrah. We left to go perform the pilgrimage. Ma jitna li qitali ahad. We did not come to fight no one. So my thoughts is that we go towards Mecca. And if they come in our way, and we go face to face, then that's when we fight them. Not go out of our way to fight them. Did the Prophet ﷺ take that opinion? Over his opinion? Did he? And the answer is yes. He said, Bismillah imdu. Then let's go ahead. So this whole mentality, you have to be watchful. As a parent, as a teacher, ask sometimes, every now and then, your students, and you have to be very wise what to ask. What do you guys think? What should we do? And every now and then, let what they proposed is what happens. They feel valued. They feel, you know what? My opinion matters. So instead of us buying Tropicana orange juice, I'll buy simply, uh, simply, simply juice. Yeah, may Allah grant. There's a high level of orange juice, and we'll get there one day, inshallah. Right? So we're like, okay, that's why you think we should buy? Yalla, let's go for it. Right? So Rasulullah, he opened the floor, and he said, let's proceed. Whoever comes, then that's what we need to fight. Alhamdulillah. Brothers and sisters, the believers are going. Intention, Umrah, Bismillah, and being very watchful, the news comes worse than the first one. What is it? Khalid ibn al-Walid, like the ultimate warrior of Quraysh. Himself, what about him? He's left Mecca with a group of horsemen coming to fight you. The Prophet ﷺ, he tells the companions, change direction. Go to a different direction. It can be longer, but it's fine. And they took another direction. Khalid is coming so fast, and they were able to escape, and they escaped, Khalid and Walid. By the time Khalid and Walid came to where he thought they would be at, he was shocked. Where did these people go? And he realized that they escaped. So Khalid and Walid, he rushed back to Mecca to warn them Muhammad and his companions should be very, very close. And indeed he was right, but why he was very shocked? Perhaps one of the reasons was the terrain, the path the Muslims had to divert to. They went to a very difficult terrain and path. It was so difficult, some people's feet would have gotten, gotten damaged from it. The animals would have gotten exhausted from it. It was so difficult to take that path, to avoid the fight. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, whoever goes through that path, Allah will forgive all their sins. That's how difficult. But you know what? We also have the benefit from this hadith. We also benefit from a hadith similar to that. Why? The Prophet ﷺ, he also told us, not a single one of you here, no believer ever gets hurt emotionally, physically, even if it's a thorn that pricks them. As simple as that. A seat that may not be comfortable to you. Sweat that may making you a bit irritated. Heat, whatever the case is, that is causing you difficulty. Whether small, that people belittle, or magnificent, that people will be shocked about. Whatever you go through, the Prophet said, it will be means of you to be purified from your sins. Allahu Akbar. Everything. So right now, you're like, when is this gonna end? I'm struggling. Oh, see that struggle? Sins being forgiven, inshallah. Are you calling me a sinner? Relax. <laughs> I'm not calling you a sinner. But that's one of the possible reasons of why you're going through a hardship. Tayyip, what, any, listen, I'm pretty old enough to keep going through hardship because of my sins. I really, honestly, I'm not being a show off. I don't think I'm that bad to continue to be purified like that. But I'll tell you, think of the Prophet ﷺ. What about him? The Prophet ﷺ. Is he not someone whom Allah said, I will forgive your past and future? Yes or no? But was he also not the one who faced the most tests out of all beings? Was it to purify him from, from sin? A'udhu Billah. What was it if it's not purification? It was for elevation. To elevate his status in Jannah. So may Allah elevate all of your statuses in Jannah. Ameen Rabbil Alameen. The Prophet said, some people, Allah 
make them go through hardship. That's what the Prophet said, authentic narration. Allah makes some people go through hardship and He gives them the patience to withstand it so they can attain a level in Jannah without these hardships, they would have never made it. Allahu Akbar. You see now how you view things like that? May Allah protect us. So all the companions, they go. Do you think they will pass? Every companion joined. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ was about two miles away. Two miles away, roughly. In a place called Hudaybiya. He was getting there so close. And once you come to the nearby area, it's a sacred land. No fighting should take place there. If you want to go to the finish line, all of a sudden, what happened? The camel of the Prophet ﷺ freezes, stops, then sits down. Like now? Random. That's why it appeared. So the Sahaba, the companion said, Get up! Hell, hell! Get up! So it was not getting up. Get up! They're not, it's not getting up. So they said, Khala'atil Qaswa. This camel is stubborn. The Prophet said, Don't say that. Don't say that about my camel. No, no, this is not the... Qaswa was the name of the camel of the Prophet He said, this is not the character of my camel. He defended the honor of an animal. You don't talk about the animal like that. Subhanallah. If that was what he did to an animal, what will he do to a human being? May Allah forgive us. Today we may defend the honor of the animal. We do. But sometimes more than the way we defend the human being. And you see it over the news of thousands of people, perhaps of the believers dying. No wait for them whatsoever. But a panda being injured, and we don't belittle that. We actually wish the best for all the animals on it as Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, what do you say? When you want to go slaughter and sacrifice your animal, what do you say? Sharpen the knife. Why? Because you don't want to torture the animal. Allahu Akbar. This is their deen. This is Islam. We're proud of that. The Prophet in he's defending the camel, so you promise us all, inshallah, I promise you, I will do our best. You see the honor of your brother and sister being stabbed, you speak up. Promise, inshallah, the way Aisha did when Mustah was spoken about, remember, and the way the Prophet did when this camel was criticized. And don't be shy to tell them, hey, 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 hey hold your horses, or whatever they can, hold your brakes. Okay, don't talk about it. this is wrong. And don't be shy and nervous about it. We defend the honor of our brothers and sisters to your best of ability. You know what the Prophet said? مَنْ ذَبَّ عَنْ عِرْضِ أَخِيهِ بِالْغِيبَةِ أَعْتَقَ اللَّهُ رُقَبَتَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ Whoever defends their brother and sister when they're being backbitten, spoken bad about, even if it's true, don't. If you defend your brother and sister, the Prophet said, Allah will unleash your neck from fire. What does that mean, unleash my neck? It means Allah will never take you to hell. Because of that one move of defending your brother and sister. So let's not now collaborate on ruining them. May Allah forgive us. See, the shaitan did not want this to proceed. So. <laughs> it's dead, right? So let me ask you a quick question. Uh, do we have batteries? <laughs> See, we took the means. We wait for Allah's victory. Allah's victory. <laughs> Are we shaken now? So I have to remember. We're being shaken. So Allah's victory is coming. Ya jama'ah. <laughs> I got to walk the talk or I ruin my entire lecture. We just spoke about this to teach the people. Right? I love the ICD for a limited time. <laughs> okay, this is what I'll do, inshallah. I'll speak a bit loud, but I'm not yelling. I'm just speaking. Khalas? Where was I? I forgot. The honor, my honor, okay. Yalla. Let's, let's proceed. Astana? Ashasali? He's doing this. What should I do? Oh, the, the wireless microphone. Ah, see? Nasrullah <laughs> Qareeb. Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. Shub, I'm not going to lie. I was nervous. I was like playing it cool. I was actually nervous. I'm like, yeah, Jamal. All right, Bismillah. Okay. Honor. Naam. So the Prophet ﷺ defended the honor of the camel. He says, ما خلعت القسوة. Okay, then what happened? He said, what stopped the camel today is what stopped the elephants back in the day from attacking the Kaaba. Many years ago, the year the Prophet ﷺ was born. Okay, I'll do that. 
This is like double victory. This is like inna ma'al usri yusra, inna inna ma'al usri yusra, right? Both. Like double the ease. Don't stop staring at Jama'ah. <laughs> oh, no. One second. Okay, say dhikr, subhanallah, alhamdulillah. Say dua. Say, may Allah help this miskeen on stage. Do you think we should edit this part? Really? Do you guys think we should edit the entire part? Leave it? Who thinks leave it? Raise your hand. You guys serious? Like why? I don't, what's the wisdom? <laughs> I, I don't question God, but I'll question you all. Khalas, you know what? I will leave it. <laughs> I can't believe it. Okay. But it's not, not the whole thing, right? Okay, Bismillah. So Rasulullah Sallam, he defended, defended the honor of the camel. He said what stopped the camel now is Allah who stopped the elephant many years ago, basically, when the elephants tried to crush the Kaaba or the people of the elephant. And this happened, the elephant incident, the year the Prophet ﷺ was born. So it's about 60 years ago. So he said this is from Allah. So then the Prophet ﷺ could not basically proceed further to the Kaaba. He stopped where he's at. He kind of just shifted a bit to the side until he landed near a well. And the well was known as the well of Hudaybiyah. But the well had very little water. Very little water. The companions drank from that well, Hudaybiyah well, until they run out of water. Brothers and sisters, the companions complained to the Prophet ﷺ, we need water. So the Prophet ﷺ, what did he do? Did they not go through the terrain, yes or no? Did they not try to take the means, where, send the scout, where the ihram, mark the sacrificial animals, did they not take the means? Then Bismillah, let's see how Allah responds. Let's see what happens next. The Prophet وسلم, and Allah can do whatever he wants. But here the Prophet took an arrow from his bucket, an arrow. He told the companions, throw that arrow into the well. So the companions took that arrow and see the submission of the companions. Right? What did some of Bani Israel do to Moses? They said, you're making fun of us? Making fun of us? Go get a cow and things of that sort? What can a cow, remember? Going back and forth? The Prophet said, put the arrow in the well. We put the arrow in the well. They got the arrow, dumped it into the well, and the Prophet supplicated to Allah. What happened? Water started to gush from the well. The water continued to rise and rise and rise. So much water that all 1,400 drank from it, and there was enough water for the cattle and the camels and the animals, and still some water was left behind. May Allah grant us blessings in our lives. Show the barakah of the Prophet ﷺ, another proof of prophethood. Brothers and sisters, while he was there waiting, one of the people whom he trusted came to the Prophet ﷺ. What is it? What's going on? He said, Quraysh wants to come and attack you. This close to the Mecca? Yes, they want to attack you. What is it? What's going on? So the Prophet ﷺ says the following, it's very important, so you have to pay attention. The Prophet ﷺ is pushing for peace, all right? People of Quraysh, they want war. The Prophet ﷺ, he wants what? The Muslims, they want peace, no fighting. Look what the Prophet says and focus. May Allah grant us all uh, being able, able to be refreshed, or fresh to be able to understand. I mean, he says to that messenger, what is wrong with Quraysh? They have been very exhausted after all these battles, correct? Exhausted. So, this is my proposal. All what I want is peace between me and Quraysh. Let, me, let, let them leave me alone so I can talk to other people. They keep coming, keep fighting, leave me alone, let me, let me preach. Then he says, and when we have that peace, no war between us and them, and let me to the Arab, if the Arab want to fight me, or the Arab wants to accept Islam, and they end up accepting Islam, then Quraysh can join. It's a big number now, if they want power and so on. And if they don't want to join, and if they don't want to accept that peace, at least they rested enough to fight me. You see that? They rested enough to fight me. 
And if they wish to fight me, then I swear to God, I will fight them until either my neck drops, basically dead, or Allah gives us victory and Allah will give us victory. Very fair, very fair. This messenger, the Prophet ﷺ, he sent to the people of Quraysh. He goes there and he says, shall I tell you what the Prophet ﷺ has for you? The youngsters and the, or the foolish amongst them said, we don't care what he said. SubhanAllah, overzealous. The elders, they said, let's hear what he had to say. So Budayl or the man told them what exactly the Prophet ﷺ said. Then Urwa bin Mas'ud, he said to the people of Quraysh, the offer is pretty decent. You guys, what do you guys think? Reasonable? We have peace with them, with Muslims. Let the Muslims do whatever they have to do. Da'wah, they end up being fought, whatever the case is. They win, that's great for us. At least we're cousins, right? The Prophet is relatives to Quraysh. That's pretty good for us, it's a plus. And we can accept Islam, reject whatever the case is. And if he ends up wanting to fight us or whatever, and we want to fight him back, at least we arrested. So he said, let me go talk to him. Let's make a deal. So this Amr, uh, Urwa bin Mas'ud, he goes to the Prophet He goes to the camp. He goes right here in this area, roughly speaking. So he goes there and he tells them, so what's the deal? The Prophet says the exact deal. So look what Urwa, he tries to play the mind game. Ready? Look what Urwa says. Urwa says, listen, you are fighting your own family. Do you actually feel good about doing that? Like, does it make you feel like, comfortable? Are you not embarrassed? to fight your own family. Look how silly. Who is the one trying to fight the Prophet? Them. Look how ridiculous, that's how ridiculous things even sound today. Right? A group, an army, I heard it from one of the elders, was in a place where there was war. People invaded. So the soldier, the oppressor came and invaded the place. Shooting people, not differentiating who was being killed. Until one man came and bit the, arm, the, the hand of that oppressive soldier. So the soldier says, look at these bunch of animals for biting his hand. But what about you who killed all these people? You see, very unfair. So he says, do you not feel bad trying to kill your own family? What's wrong with you? He's like, let's say you win and you beat us all and you kill us all. The, what would people say? Do you ever hear anyone doing that to their own family? Shame on you, right? Basically, he's trying to shame him. Then he says, and by the way, but let's say we do fight, and we come and attack him, we're arrested, and so on. I'll be honest with you, Muhammad, I'll be honest. He's looking at the other 1,400 people, right? He's like, these faces? Like, look at Umar, Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali. You see these faces? They look weak. I think if we ever fight you again, they will run away. Abu Bakr Sadiq, he says, what? And he says, we run away from the Prophet? No way. So this man from Quran says, who in the world is this guy? Now that was an insult. So they, they said, this is Abu Bakr Siddiq. He says, hmm, if it wasn't for something good you did to me back in the day, I would have responded back to you. So then, Aurun is always talking to the Prophet, touching his beard. So what's the deal, huh? It's a mind game. So I believe it was al mughira ibn Shu'bah. Well, he had a full body armor. He chose to take it. Or he, he was, someone gave it to him. So he's standing with his sword. He put the hand of, or he's like, put your hand down. The uh, Mughira was standing next to the Prophet. So, that's like, oh. so what do you think? How about what deal we can do together? He said, put your hand down before it doesn't come back. He's like, who is this guy? They said, that's your nephew. <laughs> he's like, you loser. The Quraysh said, you loser. I backed you up when you messed up when you were young. And look at you now. So then the time for salah came, the time of wudu came, and the believers start to, when I make wudu, the Prophet was making wudu, and Urwa was looking and he was shocked at how respectful the companions were to the Prophet The way they spoke to him, the way they looked at him, they were fighting over his leftover wudu. Wow. This shocked him. He went back to Quraysh. He said, listen, you guys, listen, you guys know me. You guys know me. I went to an najashi the king of Abyssinia. I went to the king of the Roman Empire. I visited the Persian Empire. I saw kings across the world. I have never seen them respected and venerated and honored 
the way the companions honor and respect Muhammad. Allahu Akbar alayhi salam. Are we like that? Can people say that about us? These Muslims, the way they obey their Prophet is not like anything we've seen before. Can they say that about us, inshaAllah? Can they, inshaAllah? Can you work towards that, inshaAllah? Can we have such reputation, inshaAllah? Can we never be embarrassed, inshaAllah? That we do what the Prophet told us to do? Then he told the Quraysh, listen, he never told them to do something except that they rushed to do it. Ya Allah, look at the description. He didn't say, uh, then they did it. Right away they did it. Can we be like that? The Prophet said this, can we do that inshallah? May Allah increase us in Iman. Say Ameen. He was amazing. He's like, I don't think such people should be abandoned. Abandoned from going to the Kaaba. Let them go. Let them go. So they didn't like the idea. Whatever they kept negotiating. Then, brothers and sisters, Uthman bin Affan is sent as an ambassador. The Prophet ﷺ tells Uthman, I want you to go to Mecca and tell them my plan. No war. I want peace. So Uthman radiallahu goes to Mecca. Fantastic. When you go to Mecca, you need some sponsorship. Like someone to cover you. We call it today visa. <laughs> so he goes and he gets a sponsorship, gets his visa to enter Mecca safe and sound. For he, at, after all, is what? An ambassador. Once he entered, brothers and sisters, he told the Quraysh <clears throat> of the plan. They thought about it and they said, Uthman, in the meantime, why would you not, if you would like, sorry, if you would like, go and perform your pilgrimage. Go do circulation around the Kaaba. He said, I would never do it before the Prophet. Like how much did he have to hold? Imagine you got your visa to Hajj, everything like that, and you're with the Prophet ﷺ. Would you hold yourself out of love to the Prophet ﷺ? And he, he held himself. Brothers and sisters, it took so much time, so much time, so much time. Eventually, very sad news, very sad news was communicated to the believers. What happened? The news reached that Uthman got killed. Uthman got killed. The Prophet ﷺ was so angry. He assembled the believers under a tree. Serious. It's over. It's over. He's angry. You do that to an ambassador. No one in the world should do something like that. Even if they're your enemy. Even if it's your absolute enemy. If they come as an ambassadors, you don't do that to them. That's a worldwide law. Yes or no? He was upset. He assembled all 1400 next to this tree. And he said to them, listen, who will give me the pledge to fight them till death? Who will extend their hand? Who will shake my hand and give me a promise that they will join me to finish off Quraysh once and for all? Enough, those who attacked Uthman. Who is in? By the way, the sign up is death. There's no weapons, as you guys remember, hardly anything. And all of that them being exhausted and wearing the ihram clothes, remember? All that stuff and now going to war? Do you think they extended their hands? Then one companion came, he says, I'm in. The next one came, two, 10, 30, 500, 800. Every one of them gave the pledge to the Prophet. Then the Prophet, look what he did. He pointed to his hand. And he says, yad Uthman. This is the hand of Uthman. And here it is. Uthman is in. Even though Uthman is dead, Uthman got the reward. He sacrificed going around the Kaaba, yes? And now Allah honored him that his hand through the hand of the Prophet will be in. And the Prophet, what an honor. May Allah allow us to shake the hands of the Prophet in Jannah. Say, I mean, he went to put his hand. Not just that, Allah revealed Yadullah, and Allah's hand is there. Allah at the support, Allah at the reward. Brothers and sisters, Allah said, Laqad radi Allah. Allah says, I am pleased with all of them. Oh, you know what does that mean? The people of the 1400, we got to respect, yes or no? Allah said, I'm pleased. So who's there? Abu Bakr? Who's there? Umar? Who's there? Uthman? Who's there? Ali? Grand Sahaba? So the, Allah said, I am pleased with all of them. So when we talk about companions, especially the 1400, with absolute respect, yes or no? Brothers and sisters, they got this, about to get ready. But guess who shows up after they pledge? Who shows up? Uthman bin Affan. What? I thought he got killed. No, it was just fake news. Even that time. 
Oh, so did you think they got the reward? Oh, you bet. Oh, you bet you got the reward, inshallah. 100%. 100%. And that's what we love about Islam is that if you try to do your best and an obstacle comes on the way, Allah will reward you even if you don't perform it. May Allah allow us to be proud of our deen. Say, Ameen. Tayyib, Bismillah, negotiation continues, brothers and sisters. Peace negotiations are in process. The Quraysh send another person to negotiate until they reach a point that who comes? A man by the name of Suhail. Suhail. That word Suhail comes from which word? Sahel, which means <clears throat> easy. So when the Prophet saw Suhail coming, he said, Sahula alaykum amrukum. Inshallah, we will get things done. We will proceed. Things will be easy, inshallah. Why would he say that? He had the practice of being optimistic, of good omens. It's part of Islam. It's not part of Islam to have bad omens. So let's say, for example, you're leaving your house, beautiful weather. You're like, inshallah, today will be a great day. Oh, bid'ah. Like, relax. <laughs> Innovation. Yeah. Optimistic. Labas. But not when it's gloomy, you say, oh, it's a horrible day. La, 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 la. You see the difference? You go, things are going great, inshallah, khair. It's all good, bi'ithnillah. And that's how the believers, always optimistic. Always optimistic. What's your name? Suhail. Inshallah, Allah will make it easy. Right? Other people may be very pessimistic, and they're so creative, right? They're driving to go to propose to someone for marriage. They come, and all of a sudden, the train is about to cross. Like, shuf, mama. This is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The train had just crossed in front of us. And this is the sharr, the evil has passed. And the sharr has been on the other side. Let's bust a U-turn and go back home. A'udhu billah. A'udhu billah. Alhamdulillah, you busted the U-turn actually. Alhamdulillah, you didn't propose that attitude, right? May Allah protect us. May Allah grant us all Jannah. Say Ameen. Right? And this is something that some of us may go through. So very optimistic. So Suhail comes and he says, let's go and write the treaty. Allahu Akbar. A deal is about to come. Yalla, the Hudaybiyah treaty. What are the rules? Before starting the rules, what does the Prophet usually start with? Bismillah. May Allah grant you all Jannah. Say Ameen. So the Prophet ﷺ brings someone to write. Who is that wonderful person that will write? Ali bin Abi Talib. He comes. The Prophet says, Yalla. To begin, Uktub Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Rahman, the Most Merciful, the Beneficent. Yeah. So he said, No, 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 no. Stop, stop, stop. What is Rahman Rahim? What is these names? No. Write the way we know it. I don't know these names and attributes. No. Say, Bismikallahum, in the name of God. That's what you write. Ali says, La. Ali says, No, I'm not erasing it. The Prophet said, Uktubha Bismikallahum. It's okay. Write in the name of God. No problem. Is it haram? Okay. Start in the name of God. Written. Mash. Taban the Sahaba are fuming. Can you imagine Umar Khattab? Rahman Rahim Ghas bin Annak, right? Like whether you like it or not, right? But he didn't say that. He didn't verbalize that. He didn't say whether you like it or not. So the Prophet still, okay, just the introduction. This is the following conditions to be agreed upon between party number one, Muhammad, the Messenger of God. So he's like, whoa, 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 stop. Stop what, ya We didn't write anything yet. He's like, you, you want Ali to write, and Ali wrote from the Messenger of God. Listen, man. If we believed you're the messenger of God, we would have never stopped you. We don't believe you're a prophet, okay? So write it the way we know you, Muhammad Abdullah. That's why you're Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. The Prophet ﷺ says, Wallahi inni Rasulullah walau He says, I'm a prophet of Allah, even if you disbelieve in it. Ya Ali, write what? Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. Sure. But overzealousness okay, does not work now. You have to be very watchful. They try to maintain. Ali says, Wallahi, this one I'm not doing. <laughs> la, 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 la. I'm not, I'm not erasing Rasulullah. No way. The Prophet says, erase it. He says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm not the one to erase something like that. So the Prophet says, Ali, point at it. Where is it at? Because the Prophet cannot read or write. Nothing to be embarrassed about, rather to be very proud of. Why? Because the one who's teaching the world was someone who cannot read and write, which proves what he gets is revelation from the Creator. How can someone know the details of history of Moses and Joseph and Musa and Yusuf and Isa السلام, and all these things about the planets from the science to the human embryology? Is that the process correctly? You mean embryology, correct? And all these things, how other than someone who created the world? So he says, Ali, where is it? So he says, here it is, Rasulullah. So the Prophet got his finger and erased it. 
Sahaba are angry. Sahaba are angry. Okay, these are the terms of condition which Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, to be agreed to. All right, write down. Wow, what's the first condition? This is the condition. To allow the Muslims to enter and visit and do Umrah. So I had to take the notes before I told you what Suhail said. For us to go and perform what? Umrah. So this is, if we agree, we go Umrah. So I said, no. No. No what? He's like, not this year. Afterwards. Because if we let you go in this year, the Arab will talk trash about us. Oh, Quraysh became so weak. They have no opinion that can be followed. No. This year, no Umrah. Later. The Prophet ﷺ says, Ali writes. And Ali wrote it. In another year. Sahaba were, can you imagine? Wallah, I just, I just need to feel it. Imagine you got your visa for Hajj or Umrah. Okay, you go all the way to Mecca. I'm not saying like Jeddah airport. No, you, took, you went to Jeddah or whatever the case is. You took the car, arrived to Mecca. You see the Kaaba. Like, oh, sorry, we're, you know, full capacity or whatever. The, how would you feel? Not just that. This is your city. That's your home. That's your homeland. But the Prophet ﷺ said, it's fine. And that's something to appreciate. Then after that, Suhail made the condition. Ready for that one? That's tough. That was so tough, the Sahaba had to speak up. No, no way. He said, and if one of us, this is the rule, and any man that flees Quraysh to you is to be returned back. So if someone from Quraysh accepts Islam and runs and escapes to the Prophet, Muhammad has to return that man back, deport him back. The Muslim said, وَكَيْفَ يُرَدْ إِلَى الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَقَدْ أَتَانَا مُسْلِمًا A Muslim now spoke up. How do you want us to return back to you, um, one who comes to us as a Muslim? The Prophet ﷺ said, no, that's too much. He said, no. As they were talking, someone came, chained up. As they're talking, someone comes, chained up and jumps towards the Muslims. What was that? It was Abu Jandal. And who was that? Abu Jandal was a Muslim being hit and tortured in Mecca. And he escaped because he wants to go to the Muslims. You see that? Right on the spot. And you know who's Abu Jandal? Was the son of Suhail. So then Suhail said, and that's the first one you apply the rule to. My son, Abu Jandal. Abu Jandal, can you imagine? What rule? What, what? So the Prophet said, no, no. We did not sign yet. Let Abu Jandal come. We did not sign yet. Suhail said, then we will not write anything anymore and I will not work a peace treaty with you whatsoever. The Prophet said, no. No, you will. Suhail said, no, I will not. The Prophet said, no, you will make this an exception. Suhail said, no, no exceptions. The Prophet said, okay. What? He gave in. He said, to go back. Abu Jandal, all chained up. He's like, what do you mean go back? What do you mean? Like he's, he's talking, he's like... Ya ma'ashar al-Muslim. He said, oh Muslims, you want me to go back to the mushrikin after I escaped? Do you not see what's going on here? Umar got so angry. Umar ibn Khattab grabbed his sword. La, la, la. He's not going to disobey the Prophet. He grabbed his sword, swinging it in front of who? Abu Jandal. Okay, even though your hands are like that, just swing it. You can just hold it, grab it, grab the sword, right? He says, هذا المشرك دمه دم الكلب. He says, the, the blood of this disbeliever, Suhail, is like the blood of an animal. Worthless. Pick up the sword and do your thing. <laughs> That's how angry he was. But Abu Jandal did not do it. And he was returned back and the Muslims were so angry. Other rules that were given or, or conditions is that there will be no war for 10 years. And after that, Whichever tribe wishes to enter into a treaty, so if someone wants to join the Muslims, they can join into this treaty. So Muhammad's signature, any other one wants to join. And then whoever wants to join, obviously the enemy or Quraysh or so on, they can sign. And the Prophet ﷺ, the treaty was done and that's how it looked like. Something that had we been there, Allah knows our emotions. Brothers and sisters, after this was done, the Muslims were so, so down. I cannot verbalize it except in this narration. No one spoke except Umar. Umar went to the Prophet. He said something that he was very regretful in the future for. He says, are you not the Prophet of Allah? Oh. Umar went to Muhammad. He said, are you not the Prophet of Allah? He said, yes, I am. He said, are we not on the truth and they are on the falsehood? Yes. 
then why are we accepting such horrible, humiliating conditions like that? The Prophet said, listen, Inni Rasulullah, I am the messenger of Allah, and I will not disobey Allah, and basically I know what I'm doing. So the Umar says, did you not tell us we will perform Umrah? The Prophet said, yes, I did tell you, but did I tell you you will do it this year? He said, no. He said, then you will eventually make Umrah. Promise. And then Umar left. Sahaba were so down. Brothers and sisters, after this, the Prophet ﷺ told the companions that now they have to let go of their ihram, the two clothes that they were wearing for Umrah. And how do you let go of it? How do you now wear regular clothing? Certain things you have to do. You have to, after obviously they're being very shocked, you have to cut your hair or shave your head for the brothers. And what they will do is sacrifice the animals they brought with them, remember? So the Prophet tells them, Qumu, go, stand up, cut your hair, and sacrifice the cattle. Not a single companion got up and did the command of the Prophet. Not one. He said, get up, cut your hair, shave your heads, and sacrifice the cattle. Lam yaqum ahad. Wala one companion got up. He said it a third time. And the Prophet ﷺ was hurt. No one got up. The Prophet went to his tent. And who was there? His wife, Umm Salama. He was so down. He said, yeah, Umm Salama, do you see what the companions are doing? His wife. And look, the wife comes in again. She said, do you want them to do what you told them to do? Yes. She said, you go outside. Don't say a word to them. Don't say a word to them. You go outside. You cut your hair. You sacrifice the animal. So he went outside, didn't say anything. And then he started having his hair, got the barber to cut his hair, shave his head, and he sacrificed the animal. The narration says all the companions followed suit. Allahu Akbar. Save the companions as Umm Salama. May Allah grant her Jannah. Say Ameen. And then they all got up. You know what the narration says? They were cutting and shaving each other's heads and they injured one another out of anger. Like, Here you go. All right. How was that? You like that? How were the rules, by the way? Right? Okay, Allah, Allah knows what they said, but the hadith says that they injured one another out of the like so upset. Brothers and sisters had the cattle sacrificed, and then revelation came. What revelation? Allah says, Inna fatahna laka fathan. Continue. Mubin, Allah says this was great success, great victory. The Prophet, when he got the revelation, he said, Umar, called Umar to come over. Umar came. He said, Ya Umar, Allah revealed that what happened was victory. Victory will come from it. Umar said, this is really conquest. This is really success and victory. He said, yes, it is. So Umar and all the companions felt relaxed, felt comfortable. May Allah make the Quran our comfort to our hearts. Brothers and sisters, and they were heading back to Medina, coming to the end of this. As they were going back, what happens? Sisters start to come. Huh? Sisters left Mecca as Muslims, Allah, believing women, tried to escape and go where? To Medina. Amongst them, you know who was it? Umm Kalthum, the daughter of Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt. Umm Kalthum, the daughter of the one, the man who tried to choke the Prophet to death. Remember? She was the daughter of the man who threw the filth of the camel on the Prophet when he was praying. But something I learned, we all learn. Having a horrible parent like that, whom Allah spoke about in the Quran, does not mandate that we don't respect their children. We don't give them a chance. Allahu Akbar. His daughter, the one of the worst disbelievers in history towards the Prophet, his daughter Umm Kulthum accepts Islam. May Allah allow us to be wise on how to behave with people. Say Ameen. Tayyib, when the believing sisters come, will the Prophet return them? No. What about the treaty? La. Allah says, to the Prophet, if the Muhajirat, the believing sister, they come, then confirm that they're believers. If they were true believers, then keep them with you. Keep them in Medina. Allahu Akbar. And they came and they stand. Look at the Islam honoring the sister. The contract, by the way, was mentioning when the men leave. So then after that, believing brothers come. Ah, Abu Basir come. Abu Basir, he comes to Medina. Excited. I made it. He escaped Mecca. I'm a Muslim. I'm in Medina. Excited. 
And who follows him? Two soldiers from sent by Quraysh. So the two soldiers, they come to the Prophet. They're not even talking to Abu Basir. Ya Muhammad, uh, the treaty. A man comes to you, you return him back to where? To us. You hand him to us. So then Abu Basir, what's going on? And he gets handed to the two soldiers. He accepts that, respects that. Then the Abu Basir, he goes with the two soldiers. They take some rest on the way back to Mecca. One of the soldiers had a sword. Abu Basir said, man, that sword that you have is awesome. He's like, oh, you bet it is. Then he took it out. He's like, shoo, shoo. He's like, I did and I did with the sword things and wonders. Such a powerful sword. Abu Basir said, man, can I check it out? He's like, yeah, here you go. He's like, oh, <laughs> killed him. He had to try it. <laughs> you know, he wants to try it. So Abu Basir got the sword and he killed one of the soldiers. The other one freaked out. What just happened? And he ran. Where do you think he ran? To the Prophet Because <laughs> he knows the Prophet will never break his promise. So he, he ran, he ran, and the Prophet saw, saw him coming. He said, this man saw something that terrified him so much. The guy comes, Ya Rasulullah, the guy Abu Basir who was here. Oh, the Abu Basir, he killed my other friend. And uh, he helped me out. He, he wants help. Who comes? Abu Basir. So Abu Basir said, Ya Rasulullah, you did your part. I got handed to them. Okay? So the Prophet says, Wayla Ummi. What kind of guy are you? Musa'ir Harb. About, you're about to cause some war. So he, the Prophet hinted that I'm going to hand you back to them. So Abu Basir got the point and he escaped. And then the soldier basically escaped. So Abu Basir, he did not go back to Mecca. He went to the coastal part of Arabia. And any brother who becomes Muslim, he heard, or he already heard about Abu Basir and others joining him. So more and more people joined. Guess who joined? Abu Jandal, he escaped again. Remember Abu Jandal? <laughs> right? He just jumped in the middle of the Muslim. He escaped and he went with Abu Basir. And more and more brothers joined and joined and joined and joined. And any trade caravan Quraysh has, they go all attack it, all out. Until Quraysh was sick of it. They felt not safe from these Muslims who, the Prophet has nothing to do with it. So the Quraysh send a note, O oh Muhammad, we beg you, change that rule. Whoever comes to you, keep them. <laughs> keep them. You see the conquest, you see the victory, you see the success. They are the ones who changed the rule. So Abu Basir, Abu Jandal all came and joined the Muslims. Peace, year after year. And one of the scholars said, Islam was spread so much so that the number of people that accepted Islam in these couple years was more than all the Muslims at that time when it began. Islam spreads during peace a lot further than during times of war. Remember that. And that's what the historians and the scholars have said. And who was one of the greatest, most famous converts? A great man, a great star, phenomenal. Who was he? What's his name? Who are these people? What happened next? All of these things, inshallah, on March 13th, on Friday. Let's hear, inshallah, some announcements.